I am an American. I come from Fairview, Montana. I am a Frenchman, and I come from Paris. I'm an Englishman, and I come from London. I am a Dogra. I come from the Himalayas, India. I am an American. I come from Gladewater, Texas. I am a Pole. I come from Silesia. I'm a Welshman, and I come from Glamorgan, South Wales. I am a New Zealander. I come from Wyndham, South Island. I am a Canadian, and I come from Montreal. I am an Italian, I come from Parma. I am a South African, I come from Johannesburg. I am American, I come from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I am an Irishman, and I come from Cork. I am a Frenchman, and come from Alsace. I am an American, I come from Boston, Massachusetts. I am a Brazilian, I come from Pernambuco. I am an American, I come from Rome, Georgia. I am a Sikh, I come from Amritsar, Punjab, and India. I am a Scot. I come from Greenock. I am an American. I come from Brooklyn, New York. These are the men of the Allied armies, the men who fought and won the Battle of Italy. They came from every corner of the earth, soldiers from 27 nations fighting side by side on the Italian front. On June 19, 1944, the Allied armies of Italy took Elba and with it the palace of Napoleon. Napoleon would have been surprised he didn't think very much of Allied armies. There is no army easier to conquer than a combination of allies. Yet 130 years later, a combination of Allied armies was again in the field. A combination so varied that road signs had to be painted in a dozen different languages. And there were so many insignia that not even the generals knew them all. MPs would answer in every tongue from Polish to Hindustanic. And three different MPs might work on the same crossroads. Vehicles were dedicated to girls of five continents. Only the Jeep was universal. Ration trucks had to bring wine for the French, tea for the British, spaghetti for the Italians, and corned beef hash for the Yanks. At a water hole, four nations would wash their trucks and themselves. Before battle, they asked for strength in many different ways. So many nations, so many creeds and faiths and ways of life. How were they welded into one fighting force? It began in North Africa when the combined chiefs of staff set up a joint command. The generals knew all about Napoleon, but they were determined to make it work. And as they fought their way across Tunisia and across Sicily, general got to know general. And then G.I. Joe began to know Tommy Atkins. On D-Day, you found yourself on a British landing craft, while many a Tommy found himself going American. That worked because no matter which flag it was, you got there. Protected not by your Navy, or the other fellow's navy, but by the whole allied Mediterranean fleet. American ships, British ships, French ships. To say nothing of the Greeks, the Poles, the Yugoslavs, and the Dutch. The pilot who watched the skies above you might be a South African farmer, a boy from London, or from Paris, or New York an Australian from the Pacific, or a Greek from Athens. Their wings were different, but they flew side by side. In the mountains, Italian Alpini were bringing rations to New Zealand infantry to be relieved the next day by an American Negro company. While Polish troops rolled forward over bridges built by American engineers of British materials, 
and guarded by Italian sentries. At Casino, American 240s were supporting British infantry, while British naval guns were softening up the coast road for the Yanks. Over at French Corps, American tankmen fought under French commanders. It worked. that the nearest medic took charge. No one stopped to find out whether you came from Coventry or Kansas or Calcutta. Americans and British carried the same stretcher. You had lived together. You had endured together. And some of you had died together. But you had learned that if the man besides you fights well, you respect him whether he comes to Chicago or Manchester or Timbuktu. And if allies respect each other, no matter what Napoleon said, they can win.
John Patrick. Despite this British uniform, I'm an American. I belong to an American outfit, the American Field Service, a strictly volunteer outfit of a thousand men who couldn't get into the United States Army or Navy for any one of a dozen reasons, but wanted to see action. The reason for these British uniforms is that we're attached to the British as ambulance drivers and, when needed, stretcher bearers. And the reason for that dates back to 1914, when some Americans in Paris dug up some old ambulances and pitched in up at the front. This time, before America entered the war, the AFS pitched in again. Yes, they pitched in and they kept right on pitching. And not one of them had to. Here's a group of them en route to the fight in Burma. Already, a lot of these men on board had met Nazis in Africa, Italy. Now, Japs ahead, with frontline duty guaranteed every man on one of the toughest fronts of a tough war. In India, a train trip to Bombay was the first step in the long haul to Burma for these Americans in khaki, who, if they'd wanted to, could have been at home in blue serge suits. Salesman, carpenter, banker, actor, Americans from 17 to 55, rejected, and in some cases discharged from U.S. service for everything from a bum heart to even a wooden leg. Now each of them was about to take on G.I. life British style, K.P., latrine duty and the rest, simply because they'd been determined to get into the show. And the day the British issued them their battle dress, Gurkha hats, bush jackets and monsoon boots, they knew it wouldn't be long before they got their wish. time they pulled out of headquarters for the 2,000 mile trek across the face of India to Burma and the fighting, they knew their British ambulances inside, out and under. And it was just as well. For 37 days the road was to wind through the heat and flies and dust of the western Ghats, on through the Punjab to Manipuri. Rocky country, wild, remote and ancient. A bleak, dusty India the storybooks don't bother with. Finally, the AFS men pushed up the last long climb into the Naga Hills and the Burma Front. This was it. It was a brief moment for a welcome from the brigadier in charge moment to wander through the hill village to try to tell a Naga from a Sikh or a Manipuri, or to practice bargaining with the natives to get the most out of the 20 bucks a month AFS pay. But it was a brief moment. There was work to do. Past lumbering elephants, the road wound to forward jungle stations, where crack Indian troops were already rushing construction on slit trenches and bunkers for the increasingly frequent Jap air raids. And hasty first aid posts were thrown together for the growing stream of British wounded coming down from the jungle hills on every side. Things were getting tight, dangerous. There was plenty to keep their minds off the daily bully beef and tea when any meal might be interrupted by a raid. And every day was punctuated by a dozen running jumps for the nearest slit trench when the Japs came over. There was plenty of work to do, too as through the weeks the shot-up Tommies grew in numbers. Fighting guys who kept their lip buttoned and tight and didn't know how to complain. Yeah, for the American volunteers, there was plenty of everything. But suddenly, destroy all equipment which can't be evacuated. That was the British order. The British were withdrawing. The Japs were reinforced and breaking through. The AFS sliced their tents to strips of useless canvas. Every truck and car and ambulance that couldn't be moved was fired. Nothing which could be moved was left to the advancing Japs. The evacuation began. The only open road was narrow and jammed with troops. 
Japs were in the hills on either side with mortars and artillery. The road caught hell. So did everybody on it. So did the AFS as they did their job of clearing whatever wounded they could down to the one airstrip still out of enemy range. They got the wounded down, and Indians helped load them into American C-53s, waiting to take off to safe hospitals below. But a score of men of the AFS, the guys with the bum hearts and army discharges and wooden legs, a score of them never lived to see this escape of the Tommies they'd given their lives to save, or the hundreds more their tiny outfit has since cleared off to safety. Yes, the AFS also serves. Let's see. Well, first we'll answer Corporal Frank Alexander in the Pacific, who wants to see his old stamping grounds. Harron High School, New York City, at 3.05 p.m. when school's just gotten out for the day. Okay, Mr. Alexander, here you are. There's your 59th Street side, Frank. How does it look? Familiar? Yeah, there they are, at exactly 3.05 p.m. in November 1944. Still 4,500 of them, Frank. And they've just spent another school day studying or sleeping, getting thrown out of Mrs. Martin's history class. And they're going home now at 3, 5 p.m. Some of you will be surprised to learn we've had a pile of requests from guys in the Pacific pleading for the sight of just a little snow. To mention a couple, Sergeant Bill Jennings and Corporal McGinnis in New Guinea wrote us. And T5, Bob McBrien who calls me Whack Lady, wrote that he, as keeper of cell 33 out somewhere hot, wants his buddies to see a snowstorm. In fact, he says, you might even make it a blizzard. Does that look snowy enough, gents? And one gets you five that these bundled up G.I. Joes in Iceland and the Aleutians in Alaska would gladly trade it to you for free any time you ask. In fact, nine out of ten guys on shoveling detail would throw in a month's pay and a pair of these frisky snowshoes for a couple of coconuts and a mosquito net. And to sum up, it's easier to look at snow than live in it. And there's one soldier who gets the point. Anybody who would like to trade, write me. And I guarantee you, I can't do a thing about it. But let's get out of the next request. So far, more Chicago boys have sent in hometown requests than anywhere else. So Chicago it is. Corporal Charles Farrar, Corporal Lee Smith, Privates Jack Alexander, Norm Woodrone, Dino Bliss, Lou DiAfaro, and the rest of you, your city of Chicago, Illinois. There she is. And you've got half a minute to see her, fellas. How would you do it? Run over to the river, maybe, looking past the bridges at the Pure Oil and Wrigley buildings? Or would you drop down to Michigan Avenue around the Art Institute? Maybe saunter up past the library toward the Tribune Tower? Perhaps you'd want to get over into the Loop at State and Madison to see your hometown folks go swarming past, up past Fields and Carson Peary's on the trolleys, shoving and hurrying to beat the red light at the corner. Would you try the L, maybe? The Ravenswood Express making the loop at Van Buren. Sure, we know. Even for half a minute, you wouldn't bother with the loop or LaSalle Street or the stockyards or anything else. There's a hundred thousand of you who'd be on that bus, heading for home as quick as you could leg it, even for half a minute. This week's most unusual request comes from a private named Charles Moore out in the Pacific. 
who sent us the words to a song he's written, asking us to put some music to it, and then find him a dream lady to sing it, which is exactly what we've done. Charlie, meet your dream lady, Miss Carol Bruce. Hello, Charlie. Here's the song you wrote. You sent it to us and said if you ever heard it sung, you'd faint. Well, get ready to faint, Jack, because here it is. Those times of old, a girl to hold, the dream that I want to come true. No lonely night, no jab to fight, the dream that I want to come true. Walk down Main Street, I'm dreaming of two To love my loved ones is what I want most to do Oh, how I pray for that sweet day When beautiful dreams all come true So long, Charlie. Thanks, Carol. And incidentally, Charlie, Miss Bruce would love to have you come up and see her sometime. I've got her phone number for you, for you only. That's all we can crowd in today, but keep those requests to rolling. And by the way, fellas, from now on, you can call me Sarge. Goodbye now. <laughs>